It's just after midnight on the 12th of June 1940, with the engines breaking the silence of the French countryside, a detachment of 12 Vickers Wellingtons is preparing for a historic mission, the first Allied attack on Mussolini's Italy. Plans had been set in place weeks before Italy had switched its status as a non-belligerent to a confirmed military ally of Germany, then advancing rapidly through France. After an impressively swift deployment to a southern French airfield, the newly dubbed Haddock Force was now about to welcome Il Duce to the conflict, less than 48 hours after his declaration of war. As the lead aircraft began to move forward, lights appeared all around the runway. In moments, dozens of lorries were parked along the airfield, blocking it entirely. No doubt confused and considerably annoyed, the British aircraft halted and engines were stopped. This confusion grew as shouts from the men in the lorries reached the ears of the aircrew. Hey, les roses beef, restez au sol, pas question de décoller. Coupez vos moteurs, sortez de vos avions, ou je fais feu. Bloody hell, it's the ruddy frogs. What the hell are they playing at? The situation, even between these two allies, was tense. In an attempt to avoid a potentially violent encounter with his ally and host, Group Captain Field made a decision. The commander of Haddock Force saw no way to carry out his direct orders and stood his crews down. The French had succeeded in stopping these British bombers from attacking their newest enemy. The trouble was, another RAF bomber force was already en route for Turin and would attack it within hours. So the question stands, what the hell were the French playing at? To understand why a group of Frenchmen from the Army de l'Air no less stopped a British bombing mission against Italy in June 1940, you have to understand what the two nations were saying to each other over the previous two years. Rather than being a complete surprise, Mussolini's entry into the war on the 10th of June 1940 was entirely expected. It was, however, something that Britain, and in particular France, had hoped to avoid. In March 1938, it had been assumed that any future European war would not see Italy pick a side. As the Munich crisis came and went, Anglo-French war planners concluded Italy would more than likely enter the war, but saw it as a fruitless endeavour for them. When Germany walked into Czechoslovakia, it was felt to be a certainty. Plans needed to be made. This feeling was confirmed with the signing of the Pact of Steel in May 1939. In the two years that ran up to the invasion of Poland, Britain and France had several conversations about future hostilities with Germany. As these conversations were escalated higher and higher up the chain of civil servants and military institutions, the subject of Italy gained focus. In fact, conflict with Italy became a key component to the Allied plans for war. Even among some gross underestimations as to the true strength of the Wehrmacht, it was rightly identified that Germany would be the stronger enemy to face. And so, Anglo-French war aims took a rough three-phase plan. Phase one would simply consist of resisting the initial Axis onslaught. A vocal majority participating in these international conversations thought that Germany might focus purely on aerial attack against British industry. Others thought that an advance through the Low Countries and Switzerland to be more likely. Whatever was to come, the Allies would move to meet it, halt the advance and hold the Wehrmacht in place. All this to buy time for their own industries to outstrip those of Germany and Italy. Of course, this phase of the plan heavily relied on the Allies' good diplomatic ties with the United States. Once an adequate war footing was obtained in the Anglo-French war industries, Phase 2 could be launched. This would consist of the total defeat of the Italian Empire. Initially, the focus would fall on the Italian colonial possessions, where they were most likely to be looking to expand their interests. Aerial and naval attacks would also be launched in the Mediterranean against Italy itself, swiftly quelling Il Duce. With Italy out of the war, Phase 3 would bring both nations undivided attention on Germany. A much tougher proposition that they could admit to themselves, but entirely feasible with the aid of their empires and foreign support. The hope during this process, however long it took, was that Japan would be content with its territorial aims in China. <laughs> so how was Italy to be attacked? A note by the Director of Plans dated May 3rd, 1940, laid out three main principles for the air campaign against Italy. 
Firstly, aircraft would only be sent out to attack at night, or when there was heavy cloud cover in the day. Secondly, to help mitigate the lack of centralization in the Italian military industrial landscape, only four centers would be targeted, Turin, Milan, Genoa and Venice. Rome would not be bombed, except in extreme circumstances. If the campaign progressed well, there were other additional targets that could be added to the list, including ones producing airframes and components, then the oil refineries and tank farms. Finally, the most effective method of attack against the Italian population was seen to be sustained harassing attacks using long-delayed action bombs. The British war planners deemed that the average Italian was ill-adapted to war, and this type of campaign would break down Italy from the inside out. It's interesting to note here that these planners also considered that the weather conditions in Italy would normally favour the attacker. Unfortunately, they were a little too on the money with this observation. They also thought that the Italian Air Defence Organisation was undeveloped, which was true to a certain extent. One of the most heavily emphasised benefits of the proposed attacks was that the three most important centres, Milan, Turin and Genoa, were less than 150 miles from the French frontier. But who would attack Italy first? The French, the British or both nations? Initially, it was thought that France herself could take up the task of dealing Italy a decisive psychological blow as soon as possible after an expected declaration of war. This was dependent on Britain supplying the Allied combined forces in the north with additional air cover. France was ever thirsty for British squadrons. In November 1939, with heightened fears that the Wehrmacht would launch an attack through Holland, France had renewed its request for more RAF squadrons on her shores and so two gladiator units were sent. The French asked that a further four be dispatched by March the following year, as long as Italy remained neutral. If Mussolini joined the war, however, Paris wanted at least 12 squadrons to be sent to defend Allied troops. Britain simply could not do it. If Italy did indeed become hostile, they would need to look to the defence of Egypt as a priority, then perhaps to reinforcing French Tunisia. French demands, though perhaps necessary, were simply unrealistic for Whitehall, and so in April 1940, moves were made to investigate establishing a small British bomber force in the south of France. While the RAF, and particularly Bomber Command, would be called upon to provide the men and machines, France would need to be relied on to supply almost everything else. The first item on the list were airfields. In a report compiled by an advanced scouting party of the RAF and dated the 6th of May 1940, three of the numerous airfields offered by the French government were analysed. Of these, Salon Airfield, northeast of Marseille, was selected as the best. Le Vallon, to the east of Salon de Provence, was chosen as a close second. Everything from transport, medical services, fuel, bombs and billets were investigated. A British bombing campaign from the location was feasible, and with French cooperation, relatively simple to put into action. Despite these findings, the AOC and C of the British Air Forces in France was sent a memo by the Air Ministry, stating that no action should be taken just yet. Further talks were being had with the French to see if they themselves would take on the task without British support. Four days later, the Germans decided the matter. The phony war that had begun the previous September erupted into a new and entirely unexpected form of warfare for the Allies. The methodical approach of the French military, which was the bulk of the Allied force facing the Wehrmacht, was particularly affected. While the French fought valiantly, they were hard-pressed in the north. That government was in no position to deal Italy a sufficient blow if she did enter the war. For that matter, neither was the BAFF. Air Marshal Barrett, commander of the British Air Forces in France, said on May 29th, It may well be that within a few days, the British Air Forces in France will be engaged in an intense struggle to maintain the very weak Allied line in front of Paris and to secure their own position and their base and lines of communication, which are already threatened by superior air strength. Under the circumstances, I can only view with concern the additional commitment now proposed. I recognize the value and possibilities of the plan, but am doubtful as to the weight of attack that could be maintained against Italy on the slender administrative basis proposed. 
while I am certain that the introduction of a new force in France at this juncture must add materially to the risks of the present situation. On the 2nd of June 1940, a conference was held to discuss operations against Italy, if and when she became hostile. During these talks, it was agreed by both sides that an immediate response in the form of bombing should be given. This the French readily agreed to. It was a distinct change from the previous Gallic stance, which favoured a retaliatory response or a purely naval campaign against Italian aggression. The next day, Group Captain Field, then with number 71 wing headquarters, was given command of the newly created Haddock Force. Along with two servicing flights, his small detachment was sent south from Nantes early on the 4th of June to put plans into action. Other small detachments would be sent later. Arriving at Salon, the new Haddock Force CO was able to establish his command within just seven days. This is remarkable when you consider the distances involved. For example, what might take eight or nine hours on the payage today took flying officer Furlonger of the number 17 servicing flight three days to achieve with his convoy. He was praised in the final write-up of the Haddock Forces campaign for completing the journey so quickly. Others were not so fortunate with the journey. During the week that it took Group Captain Field to declare himself operational, Italy declared war. She was hopelessly unprepared for it, and the act was an obvious attempt to gain a share of Germany's war booty. Mussolini confided to his chief of staff, Pietro Badoglio, that Ho bisogno di solo alcune migliaia di morti per sedermi al tavolo della conferenza, come un belligerante. Meeting with the American ambassador to France, William Bullitt, French Premier Paul Renault fume. Ah, les Italiens, qu'ils sont grands, nobles et admirables pour nous planter un couteau dans le dos. Just at this moment. It was a sentiment later repeated by the American president in his commencement speech that evening at the University of Virginia. On this 10th day of June 1940, the hand that held the dagger has struck it into the back of its neighbor. On the 11th of June, a force of 12 Wellingtons from number 37 and 75 squadrons arrived at Salon at 1500 hours from the UK. Original plans to accommodate four light or heavy bomber squadrons had been changed. Initially, a single squadron of Wellingtons would be rotated through Salon. They would conduct one or two operations against Italy and then be relieved by another squadron coming out of British bases. With everything in place, be it with work continuing up until and after Phil declared himself fit to begin the Italian bombing campaign, orders arrived. On the night of the 11th to 12th of June 1940, Haddock Force would carry out a raid on Turin. They would also be supported by a force of 36 Whitleys of number 3 group flying from Britain. This would result in the Allies launching their first salvo against the new enemy, as Italy had yet to advance onto French soil since declaring war. In Paris, questions were being asked. Was this simply a papal war for the Italians, and nothing more? For Haddock Force, no time could be wasted on pondering what Italy's war plans may be. There was a job to do, and do it, they would. Throughout the rest of the day, the aircraft were prepared, the crews were briefed, and Group Captain Field was bombarded with messages from the French. By this date, the 11th of June 1940, Operation Dynamo had come and gone. Across dozens of other ports, a further 190,000 Allied troops had been or were in the process of being evacuated to the UK. That's in addition to the 338,000 men taken off the beaches at Dunkirk. The French were fighting on, but the presence of their ally on the battlefield was dwindling. True, the BAWF still remained in place to help combat the enemy, but the Wehrmacht were advancing almost at will. Running up to the day of the planned attack, the British 51st Highland Division, along with the French 9 Corps, were facing defeat in Picardy and looking to evacuate by boat under German fire. Paris was being threatened from the north and east and declared an open city on the 10th of June. With such a perilous situation, some French leaders seemed to be re-exploring a previously abandoned notion about Italy. Perhaps any attack against that nation should only take the form of retaliation. All through the 11th of June, with the declaration of war beginning at midnight, no Italian attack towards France had come. 
perhaps France could avoid facing another enemy to its southeast if they did nothing. And now, ces putains anglais wanted to stir up the hornet's nest with a minuscule bombing force. And this is why French military leaders suddenly went against the agreed terms of the June 2nd conference. At 21.45 hours, Air Marshal Barrett, commander of the BAFF, received a telephone call from General Viermil, urgently requesting that the proposed attack be cancelled. Barrett immediately contacted the Air Ministry, but was told that they would not act without the advice of the Prime Minister, he himself being in France at the time. Barrett then called up the office of General Ismay, who was stationed at the headquarters for General Vega. Repeating the request he received from General Vierma, Barrett added that a force of bomber command aircraft were already en route for Italy and could not be recalled. What did the Prime Minister advise? Winston was of the opinion that the attacks should go ahead. Group Captain Field was contacted several times by different French commanders and headquarters forbidding any such attack. Field contacted Air Marshal Barrett at 22.15 explaining the situation. Again, a call was put through to General Ismay, who assured the air marshal that the French had agreed to the attack. Grounding Haddock Force at this point would only spawn an operation already in progress. This information was passed down the line to Group Captain Field, who was told to proceed with the mission. Then his phone started ringing again. In the course of that evening, the Haddock Force commander was contacted by the Chief of Staff of General Oudemont, the 3rd French Army, confirming a cancellation of the operation. He was also contacted by Capitaine de Vassal Latin on the staff of the vice admiral Préfect Maritime de Toulon, saying the operation was contrary to the wishes of the French government. He was then contacted by General Oudemont in person, telling Field to contact General Viermont himself to confirm the orders. In this particular conversation, Oudemont even claimed that the operation had been called off by Winston Churchill himself, following a late meeting of the Supreme Council that evening. In the face of this bombardment of instructions from the French, Field repeated that he could not disobey direct orders from his own commanding officer, who had repeatedly confirmed that the operation should proceed. Following what had been four hours of constant communication, the first Wellington opened up its engines on Salon Airfield at 27 minutes past midnight, ready to taxi towards the runway. This is when men, under the command of Commandant Treff, commander of the forces of the Army de l'Air based on Salon Airfield, drove their lorries onto the runway. Group Captain Field, no doubt feeling defeated, gave the order to stand down. It was already getting too late to start the mission, and the weather over the Alps was reported as being abysmal. He sat down to write up a report of why he had failed. Meanwhile, 36 aircraft from No. 3 Group, Bomber Command, had already taken off from their refuelling stops in the Channel Islands and were attacking Turin. Perhaps it was well that Haddock Force never made it off the ground that night, as Middlebrook and Everett describe in the Bomber Command war diaries. 23 aircraft were not able to reach Italy because of difficult weather over the Alps. Nine aircraft bombed Turin, but not the designated factories. Most bombed railway yards. Turin reports 17 people killed and 40 injured. Two other aircraft bombed targets at Genoa. Both cities were fully lit up, as in peacetime, when the bombers arrived. Turin's lights were turned off during the raid, but Genoa's were not. Heavy anti-aircraft fire was encountered over Turin. A Whitley of 77 Squadron crashed in flames near Le Mans on its return flight, and Sergeant N. M. Songest and his crew... Sergeants R. C. Asprey, P. H. J. Budden, A. Findlay, and E. Ombler were all killed. The first casualties of Bomber Command's operations to Italy, which would continue spasmodically over the next three years. In response to this attack, Italy did indeed retaliate. Mussolini ordered a bombing campaign against southern France, and the Regia Aeronautica would fly 1,337 sorties over 75 raids, dropping 726 tonnes of bombs. French defences against these raiders, though often in obsolescent aircraft, were almost non-existent. In fact, Italy had been the ones to launch the first bombing raid against the Allies, attacking Malta on the 11th of June, starting a siege that would last until November 1940. Other raids were also launched by both sides in North Africa, so delaying Haddock Force was ultimately futile. Group Captain Field received further orders to mount an attack on the night of the 12th of June, but this was soon countermanded and the Wellingtons remained on the ground. 
Later that day, a signal was received calling for all operational crews, support staff and aircraft to be flown back to the UK. During that day, Field had been visited by Generals Gamma and Oudemont in person, as well as representatives of the vice admiral Préfet Maritime de Toulon and the 3rd French Army. Apologies were made over the need to intervene the previous day. The next day, the 13th of June, a request was made by the Army de l'Air for information about Haddock Force's proposed targets. They would be mounting a raid on Italy themselves that very evening. Group Captain Field also received new orders telling him to remain where he was, as Haddock Force would be operating again soon. By the 15th of June, French commanders had reversed their previous stance, giving Haddock Force permission to take off from Salon. During that day, 12 additional Wellingtons arrived from 99 and 149 squadrons under the command of Group Captain Harrison, along with other detachments via road. That night, finally, eight Wellingtons were dispatched to attack Genoa. The effects of this raid were minimal, but the danger to the British crews immense, especially in terms of adverse weather. A second attack was launched the following night against Milan, by 22 Wellingtons with 14 bombing the city with no losses. At 10 to 1 in the morning on the 17th of June, just seven days since Haddock Force was declared operational, Group Captain Field received a message calling for it to be evacuated. With this order confirmed, the returning Wellingtons were refuelled and made ready to depart back to England by 0930. When Field had first arrived in his new zone of operation, he had immediately contacted local naval forces at Toulon and Marseille to plan a potential evacuation. After again consulting with the British naval liaison officer, Toulon, that morning, it was deemed that Marseille was the better choice for Haddock Force, and several convoys of men and materiel were dispatched to that port. Alarmingly, even as the orders to evacuate were coming in, groups of men were just arriving to bolster the ranks of Haddock Force. Indeed, a detachment of 702 Company Royal Engineers had just arrived at Salon from Rennes, a five-day trip during the confusion of the latest German offensive in the Somme region. Haddock Force was in a precarious situation. Having roused the Regia Aeronautica, anti-aircraft defences were essential for a safe embarkation at Marseille. That particular region of France had minimal fighter defence. True, three squadrons of French fighters were stationed in the region, but this amounted to almost nothing in terms of actual protection from air attack. Even AA guns were in short supply, and it was necessary for Field to relocate the handful of guns he had at Le Vallon to the docks at Marseille. Then at 11.30, new orders arrived. Haddock Force was to remain where they were and continue operations. This order was verbally given to Group Captain Field by Air Marshal Barrett himself. Riders were sent out to track down the already departed convoys and turn them round. Personnel at Salon were told to start unloading stores and material that they had been loading since daybreak. Just before 1300 hours, Barrett was back on the phone with Field. The evacuation was to go ahead at all speed. Group Captain Field arrived at Marseille around 1700 hours that day and was immediately given a message from Captain Souter. It said that Admiral Watkins, British naval liaison officer to the French, wished Haddock Force to return immediately to Salon and take up operations to help support the French Air Force and Allied naval forces. The French, according to Admiral Darlin, were going to continue the fight, and so too should Haddock Force. Field called up Toulon but failed to reach Admiral Watkins. He explained to a subordinate that without receiving direct orders from his AOC in C, he could not return to Salon. Even if he did, operations could not begin again for some time. His men were exhausted, and many necessary and sensitive documents had been burnt during the evacuation. In the meantime, Field requested that his men be allowed to embark the two merchant ships allotted to them for evacuation. His men needed to rest. Field had planned to load as many stores as he could onto these ships, but it was found that no suitable cranes were available along the crowded docks. What could be manhandled aboard before dark was stowed away. The rest was left ashore, a task for the next day. At 4.30 in the next morning, the order was given to evacuate Haddock Force. On the dock and back at Salon, tons of stores had been left behind, as were men. Amazingly, small detachments were still trickling in as Haddock Force made for Marseille. Orders were left with local authorities with the hope that these men would make it to the ships. Many did not.
Also, amazingly, the previous afternoon, when all personnel had left Salon bound for Marseille, a transport aircraft landed at the airfield. The pilot had telephoned for orders. He was told to return to the UK. His £5,000 hold, empty. Haddock Force was on its way to North Africa. In the week that Haddock Force existed, they managed to launch two raids against Italy and dropped 17,160 pounds of bombs on Genoa and Milan. This was all carried out amidst abysmal communication with Britain and the BAFF, and intense misinformation from the French. No clear plan of operation had been transmitted to the field, and the only intelligence he had on the enemy was what one of his officers, squadron leader Donovan, could grab from North Eagle before leaving Orléans. In the end, the entire raison d'etre of Haddock Force, which was to deal Italy an immediate blow upon entering the war, was achieved by number three group operating from British bases. So what do you think? Was Haddock Force worth it? Please let me know in the comments. And if you'd like to know more about Haddock Force, I invite you to check out the source material I found at the National Archives. You can find a link to the PDFs on my website below. Also, a special thanks to Julian Hall, who was the first one to put me onto this interesting story when he told me about the subject of his master's thesis. If you found this video useful, please give it a like to help spread the story, and why not watch another video about the RAF in the early days of World War II on screen for you now. It's a good one.